Ever wondered how Maimonides Rambam talks about wine, drinking, and drunkenness and is guided to perplexed? Well, you're in luck. You've come to the right place. That's something we're going to explore on this 160th episode of The Jewish Drinking Show, bringing L'chaim to life. Hi. Welcome, everybody, to the newest episode of The Jewish Drinking Show. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm excited to welcome back second-time guest of the show, Rabbi Dr. Phil Lieberman. Phil, welcome back. Thank you so much, Drew. Absolutely. So those... Uh, perhaps less familiar with Rabbi Dr. Lieberman, he is a social, economic, and legal historian of the Jews of the medieval Islamic world. He holds a BA with distinction in economics from the University of Washington, a MSc in economics from the London School of Economics, an MA in Talmud and Rabbinic Coordination from JTS, an MA and PhD in Near Eastern Studies from Princeton University, and Smicha, Rabbinic Ordination from my alma mater, Shiva Chobe Torah. He is Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and Law, Associate Professor and Chair of Classical and Mediterranean Studies, Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Affiliated Associate Professor of Islamic Studies and History at Vanderbilt Uni University, but he is currently on military leave and serves as Associate Professor in the Department of History at the Uni United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. He also serves the U.S. Navy Reserve as a chaplain and was mobilized to Camp Lumanier, Djibouti, where he served as command chaplain. He was promoted to the rank of captain just this past August, uh, August 2023 and is the ranking Jewish chaplain in the Department of the Navy. And his 2014 book, The Business of Identity, Jews, Muslims, and Economic Life in Medieval Egypt, was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. His latest book is The Fate of the Jews in the Early Islamic Middle East, 2022. And bringing us to our topic today, just published this year, his translation with Len Goodman of Maimonides' 12th century philosophical classic, The Guide to the Perplexed, was published by Stanford University Press. How many English translations are there of The Guide to the Perplexed? In the early 20th century by a guy named Michael Friedlander, and then subsequently translated in the, in the 1960s uh, by Shlomo Pinas, um, you know, best known for uh, his ties to the University of Chicago School of Thinking, and particularly that of Leo Strauss, who writes an extensive introduction to the to the uh, 1965 edition. Hmm. Um, it was also translated by Chaim Rabin in sections um, published by Hackett. Um, hmm. And so, uh, the most recent sort of effort at translation before ours. I would say is my beloved colleague Alfred Ivory's book um, on the guide, in which he goes kind of section by section, not not chapter by chapter, but mm. writ large, kind of section by section, discussing what the Rambam is doing in that major section, and then providing a paraphrase of the penis translation. So, mm. it, you know, it's not a translation itself, but it's a really useful tool for getting what Rambam is doing in the guide, and then drilling down to uh, the language itself. Cool. All right. So I may ask you about the different translations later, but I do want to, before we get to the actual meat of, or I should say the wine of our conversation, <laughs> which, which is what, you know, what is the, clearly there are multiple translations. There's a lot of interest. What is the, how would you describe the cultural import of this work? As So Maimonides, you know, he's very famous within the Jewish history, his Mishnah Torah has long-lasting effects uh, for halakha, Jewish law. He's he's written many different works, including his uh, commentary to the Mishnah. Where would you place the guide to the perplexed within all of this? Right. So, uh, you know, this is obviously going to be different in different times, right? In the Rambam's time, I don't think the guide was oh, something that... Sorry? Actually, before you... How would you describe what the work is for those less familiar with this? Yeah, so uh, I think the guide is a critically important work because, and it's critically important work for our time, because mm -hmm. in the book, Rambam is trying to approach someone who is connected with tradition, uh, you know, in his case, you know, obviously Torah, mm -hmm. and, and also has an exposure to a familiarity with science. And sees that there are some tensions there and wants to square them, right? In, in our world, we see religion and science much of the time as inimical to one another. And I think that the major intervention of the book, which still carries great weight today, is to bring together uh, religion and science and to say, listen, you might have 
you know, some, um, uh, you know, some, some doubts about religion because it doesn't seem to comport with science, right? Or you might have some doubts about science because it seems to challenge our fundamental beliefs, our most important, most intimate beliefs, right? Uh, you know, about religion. But he says, no, these two can square with each other. And we see this from the very, very introduction to the book. In the beginning of the book, he writes the book for a guy named Joseph and Judah. And at the beginning, he writes a letter to Joseph and Judah. And he says, listen, you know, you've done some work in, you know, the study of the Torah. And you've done some work in the study of science, right? Because after all, for him, right, science is, you know, what we would call kind of physics, right? is a precursor to the study of metaphysics, right? Mm -hmm. Without studying the sciences, you can't engage theology. But in our world, right, we see these as totally <laughs> different, right? Yeah. Like you ask people who are, you know, in the sciences, like, how can you be a person of faith that blah, blah, like, for Rambam, this isn't a question, mm. right? Of course, faith and reason are going to be like mutually supportive. And he's going to try and figure out, you know, how to draw those connections in our world. We don't need that. We just say, all right, you know, these are two different worlds. They're never going to talk to each other. They're checkers <laughs> and chess. Right. But right. Rambam, you know, we, um, you know, we wants to kind of synthesize this. And so I think that there's a continued importance to the work because in our day, we think about religion as totally like obscurantist, you know, oh, so like we live in a scientific age. I don't need that religious mumbo jumbo anymore. I think it's a tremendously important book because it allows us to sort of see those connections between religion and science. And, um, it, you know, it kind of resurrects both. Uh, for, you know, a society that sees those two as, you know, fundamentally in opposition. So, mm. you know, I think that in that sense, Ramam is speaking to an audience beyond just the Jewish community. A lot of part three actually mm -hmm. uh, is taken up with the discussion of, uh, of the commandments, right? And uh, my, uh, Rambam here in part three, like tries to, uh, you know, sort of explain how they are rationally organized. He breaks them up into 14 categories, you know, unsurprisingly, you know, there are 14 books of the, of, uh, of the Mishnah Torah. And so there is a kind of a holistic nature. Like you can see the guide in the Mishnah Torah is major work of philosophy and his major work of law. He calls it actually in the guide itself, like my, you know, big composition. There is a kind of a holistic way that the Rambam is writing. The way that some folks have seen this book is distinct from his halachic writing, right? That is to say that some folks say that he's writing as a philosopher here, whereas in the Mishnah Torah, he's writing as a halachist. You know, as someone with a PhD who also, you know, happens to, you know, call himself rabbi, right? I, I you know, I don't say anything in my classroom that that I wouldn't say in a in a in a synagogue setting, and I don't say anything in a synagogue setting that I wouldn't say in a classroom, right? I, I might emphasize one or another thing, right? But I don't say things in a way that would contradict one from the other, and I don't think mm -hmm. that that Rambam would do that either, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, even though there are those who say, yeah, there are out and out contradictions, and you know, Rambam as a philosopher is is not someone who's gonna you know sit with the rabbis, and in fact, as I you know as I said, we can talk about uh, um, you know models of translation. Um, uh, under the influence of Leo Strauss, I would say Shlomo Penis's 1965 translation really does see, um, uh, you know, this is Rambam the philosopher as opposed to Rambam the, uh, you know, the legal scholar. And mm. those two different worlds might have contradictions, not a problem. But what he's doing here in the in part three as a whole, I would say, is explaining the the Bible's, you know, the commandments of the Torah. Mm -hmm. Okay, the law and kind of rationalizing and explaining what it is that the law is supposed to do, which is to transform your mind, right? Mm -hmm. That is to say, it's supposed to engender the right set of opinions. Now, I would argue that there is also the guide itself as a holistic work. There's a, a kind of a continuity across the guide itself. If we look in part one, right, part one is very much about the language of the Torah. So yeah. in part one, there's not, I mean, I, you're... Part three does have the most, not only the most drinking, but even the most 
uh, substantive aspects. There is one yeah. section within part one. It's in chapter two that he does mention drinking. What I think is part three is, as I said, he's focused on your opinions, right? Uh -huh. How the mitzvot lead to training your mind. And so this points to Rambam as what we might call like a rational mystic, right? Mm -hmm. For him, the connection to God comes through the intellectual, mm -hmm. right? And so drinking, and this is what we see in, in, uh, part, in uh, part three, chapter eight that you just brought up, right? The reason that drinking is negative intoxication is seen as, as negative is because it clouds that path through the active intellect to God. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode featuring Rabbi Dr. Phil Lieberman on Maimonides in his Mornavuchim about wine, drinking, getting drunk. Do you like any of those things, especially the drunkenness thing and how it plays into Jewish life? We're going to be exploring into next week's episode and here's a sneak peek on duchening under the influence. A little bit novel, right? No one else has stated these stipulations. This is Rambam's own creative rubric, rubric really. Um, thoughts, comments, questions on Maimonides here. I hope you enjoyed that sneak peek onto duchening under the influence. Obviously, we're ahead of the holidays, and certainly for Ashkenazi, Diasporian Jews, this is a heavy season of duchening, so it's going to be very interesting, and I hope you come back next week to check that out. And now back into this episode featuring Rabbi Dr. Lieberman. So Solomon devotes the whole book of Proverbs to warnings yeah. against fornication and intoxication, right? So why is it that Solomon, and again, this is, uh, you know, um, Rambam's reading of the of the Tanakh, right? Again, mm -hmm. he's like looking at like what's going on about this isn't the Bible commentary like we see like Rashi or Rashbam or, you know, <laughs> line by line or Ibn Ezra, right? Mm -hmm. Line by line commentary, but the whole book is asking us to engage, you know, the Torah. So, right, Solomon devotes the whole book of Proverbs to warnings against fornication and intoxication, right? For those who wallow in these fall from God's grace and lose connection with God. He says here, eating, drinking, sex, and overindulgence as these, as well as ill temper and every other vice derived from one's matter. Yes, um, because so what what's the source of bad in the world? It's not God. The source of evil in the world, uh -huh. right? is matter matter is just like stuff that exists yeah so this is you know getting back to the ancient greek uh tension between matter and form right that so for those matter of us who are is, not familiar with greek sorry yeah so yeah. so you know again this is getting again getting back to the ancient greeks right the world kind of splits down between matter and form and you can think for instance uh you know where plato talks about the idea of pure forms right what's a platonic friendship right it's a friendship that isn't stained with the physical aspects of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, of, uh, of touch, mm -hmm. right? So that, you know, uh, you know, that, that platonic friendship is an ideal friendship, not just because, you know, that girl, that boy, you know, doesn't really like you. And it's no, let's not stain our relationship with the physical touch as it were. And so, mm -hmm. so too, right. God has an idea of what the universe is supposed to look like. You know, those are those pure forms, if you will. And then it gets instantiated in matter. And matter is imperfect. So it's almost like the physicality? The very physicality of the world, right? Okay. That sort is the source of evil, right? Mm. God isn't the source of evil. It's that it gets, you know, those ideas get implanted in matter. And that matter is imperfect. And that's what's going to decay. Mm. And so right. drinking is a part of that decay, the, the, phys, the uh, owing to the, the physicality. Physical, right. So look yeah. at the next, like, look at the next very paragraph, right? Hold on. Yeah. Right. And then he says, Divine this is wisdom really so. decreed that matter cannot exist without form. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, nor such forms as these without matter, right? We need to mix them too. We've got the noble form, right? How is it that we are like God? It's, actually, it's not in a form, right? It's not in the matter for sure. But it's in the the intellect, right? But then, like once it takes on that physical form instantiated in matter, then it's going to decay. Man's noble form, then the image and likeness of God, and this is from the very beginning of the guide, right? Is bound to matter. This dark, turbid, <laughs> earthly matter that invites every defect and decay. So that way in which we're connected to God, that doesn't decay, right? That's the form. That's the, you know, right? Mm -hmm. How is the image and likeness of God, 
right? It's not that, you know, God has a you know, face shape like this or skin like this, right? It's that Selman Demut, the image and likeness, which is, as it says here, right? Mm -hmm. And it's actually the exact words he uses of image and likeness, yeah. right? The noble yeah. form. But that gets planted in matter. And, right, everything that we do, you know, eating and drinking and sex, right? Mm -hmm. All of that stuff is, you know, meeting those physical needs. Yeah. And so that's naturally going to be connected with decay. He says, some find all bodily urges foul and unseemly, necessary evils, which seems yeah. just as Aristotle says, for, that makes us crave food, drink, and sex. He says, functions rightly kept private, minimized, and regretted, not made. The Although it's interesting, I don't know if, uh, obviously sex I understand, but uh, the food and the drink being minimized and not made topics of talk is interesting. Uh, right. I listen. Yeah. I mean, he's just saying, like, you know, you shouldn't spend all your time talking about recipes and menus <laughs> because it's just because it's just uh, physical and ephemeral. I, I think, you know, yeah. listen, I, I think he, you know, understands that you can appreciate all of those, you know, physical experiences. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the same yeah. time, you know, they're not what we're supposed to really be talking about. Yeah. Uh, right? Well, that, this is. Yeah. Well, this is uh, he, this is delicious. He says the great throng of the unwashed, curtained from God, do just the opposite. They neglect all thought and reflection on ideas, and make their sinuous here the very sense of touch that is our great shame. They have no right. ideas, no thought beyond sex and consumption. Such wretches are pictured clearly engrossed in food, drink, and sex. And then he brings uh, various biblical yeah, verses so to you can write verses. Right, right, um, right. I mean, you know, he's just saying, like, listen, you know, sometime when you're in shul and you're, you know, having a lachayim, you should talk about the scotch, but, you know, you can shift into talking about ideas as well. You know, to the extent that, you know, that's that, you know, that 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 fellowship is an entree into thinking about ideas. I think he would be in favor of it. But if all uh, you're but talking the about focus, is the yeah, just yeah. to focus on those actual physical pleasures is right. They're missing. Right. They're that's missing right. out. I we're missing out on a life of the mind. I mean, in how many of our communities, you know, do we end up? you know, talking about stuff like that, that, you know, doesn't really matter instead of talking about the big issues of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. he, I mean, this is, this is such a rich chapter. Cause then he says, what with regards to drinking, he says, what, what one must do if one chooses to be truly human and not a beast with yeah. human shape and features is strive to minimize every bodily impulse, including drinking food, drink, sex, angers, and like urges. Mm -hmm. One should find them shameful and set himself limits with necessities like food and drink he should keep to what nutrition requires, not heed the call of pleasure. So this is, he is very not, a, he's not, uh, certainly not in the pursuit of pleasure, but just what is required and mm -hmm. not seeking them out. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, he didn't like food at all. It's, you know, he wasn't, you know, eating Soylent, you know, or, you know, the, you know that is to say something that was just homogenized, uh, you know, to give him, yeah, he wasn't living off of vitamins, you know? Yeah. But at the same time, right, you know, he's, he's not making it the focus of, uh, you know, of, of his life. But he says here, no, you know, you need food, you need drink, you need sex, you need anger and, and these urges, right? But you shouldn't be giving yourself over to them. You shouldn't be, you know, living a life that focuses on them. There is something more to life. Mm -hmm. Keep what to know what nutrition requires to include anger. As we did discuss off the screen, but this uh, Psachim 49 is interesting. Uh, the sages hated. I, I don't know if it's fair to say that the sages hated banquets. It's an interesting move on Rambam's part. I don't know if they hate them. Maybe it could just be. I, this is an interesting interpretive move by Maimonides, just to say, like, we have better things to do with our lives. That's Maybe, right. That's um, right. Yeah. At the same time, it it is very possible that for Rambam. He wants to position it, this in such a fashion as to say they hated them. He just doesn't want that to be what everything is about. Look at the next paragraph, right? Drinking. Oh my gosh, this is juicy. This is great, right? Parties for drinking intoxicated liquors should be more shameful to you than gathering naked and exposed to sit and shit in broad daylight. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. This is great because defecation, you got to do it. But right. drunkenness is a choice. So if you get drunk, like this was, uh, you know, you, you, you wanted to do it. You didn't have to do it. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, right. no, it's such an over the top comment. Parties for drinking and toxic, uh, you know, drinks should be made more right. shameful than gathering naked, exposed. To, right. Like, right. meanwhile, well, no, I mean, well, there are nudists who gather on a beach or whatever, but people usually get together for drinks. That seems, to be, but it's so right. fascinating it, that he finds it particularly shameful. Okay, so hold on. Think about his context, right? So number one, right, Rambam is born in Spain, right? He's born in Cordoba, right, which you know is known for its, uh, you know, its high culture in the in the twelfth century, right? He's born in eleven thirty eight, but you know, before he hits, uh, you know, ten years old, um, his his hometown is taken over by uh you know what what many generations of of islamic historians have called kind of radical a uh, radical element um coming up from uh, from north africa a group of folks called the almohads and the almohads like really um you know kind of stringently enforce a lot of prohibitions in islamic law that it perhaps become a little bit lax so what is that high culture that i just alluded to a lot of it is poetry that folks at night would sit around their, um, uh, you know, their garden. You know, many of their gardens were, you know, they were, had a kind of a courtyard and a fountain in the middle, and they lay down on couches in the courtyard and, and declaim poetry. And much of the Arabic poetry is about, uh, you know, about wine. Even though, of course, you know, those same people who are declaiming poetry get up in the morning and they go to the mosque, and the Quran explicitly prohibits. Uh, you know, drinking wine. We've talked about this a little bit, right? Why? Mm -hmm. Quran says, you know, because, you know, you cannot pray in a in an intoxicated state of mind, right? Just as, you know, we were talking offline about the, the Kohanim, Duchne, right? Can they be intoxicated? Can they not be intoxicated, right? So, you know, Islam imagines everyone is a Kohen and everyone has to pray five times a day. And so, you know, alcohol is, uh, it's a big no-no. So this is the context that Rambam is coming up in, right? A context where, on the one hand, there are these parties all night drinking and declaiming around the, you know, around the fountain in the courtyard, right? And a lot of that poetry is, uh, you know, about wine. I would say, and, and some of my colleagues have recently identified some real connections between uh, Rambam actually as a jurist, and his uh, Al-Mohad surroundings. My colleague Mark Herman has an article mm. recently that kind of identifies, you know, how the surroundings affected Rambam as, as a lawmaker. And mm. so why wouldn't it affect how he thinks about alcohol too? You know, everybody's got to go to the bathroom, <laughs> but, you know, if you drink... <laughs> For drinking you know, parties. Yeah. No one forces you to go to drinking parties. No one forces you. No one forces, <laughs> right? So to expose yourself, that's wrong, you know, and how much more so if you really, you know, you're polluting your body and mind and that effect. Now, what's going on here really, of course, yeah. is that Rambam sees the connection to God. As I said, in part one, right, he starts with all of those words, right, to hear, to see, to, you know, to, uh, to touch and so on, right? All of those have a physical meaning, but they also have this intellectual meaning, right? And that is the way we connect to God, through the intellectual, through the active intellect. And so, if you're, you know, clogging up that pipeline, as I said, right, and you're doing it intentionally, you didn't have to drink, no one made you drink. Well, you know, that actually is a huge problem for Ram. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's actually much worse. You know, eating yeah. is one thing, but, you know, eating might make you feel like a little sluggish. Right. You know, well, he, he does understand that there's a there's a reason or, or a necessity for drinking, but it's the parties for drinking the intoxicating beverages. He says, right. OK, I understand drinking right. as an individual, but gathering together for the purpose of drinking drinks. That's problematic. Right. So listen, yeah. I mean, it's one thing to to make a toast, right? right? You know, hey, congratulations on this or that moment. But it's another thing to, you know, really be focused on, you know, uh, clouding your mind. Chapter 12 and part yeah. three. Okay. But notice, right, overindulgence in all these, excess in quantity, improper sequence, bad food, right, causes diseases and disabilities. He doesn't say drinking at all is bad. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. He doesn't say sex is bad. He yeah. doesn't say you right. You know, because we gotta eat, we gotta drink. We yeah. Got, you know. But what his, his yeah. statement in, in chapter eight was pretty significant as far as the 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 part gathering for parties that yeah. already is a, a major problem for right, for him. Uh, fine, but don't make it or about he, you know. Yeah. Know. 
And then also, right, th there's the shameful aspect of those, and then he's all, yeah, why talk about them? That's ridiculous. Or that's what the, the sort of the, the low people do. Uh, but here, this is this is just over indulgence, sort of on an individual level. Um, and then so it, and right, then it's so sort of bad for your body, right. though. It's bad right. for your body. You you need to take care of your body, right? Because yeah. your bodies matter, right? And it's going to decay, and there are going to be problems with it. When stricken by any misfortune, da -da -da -da, rails at fickle fortune for denying him the wealth to buy wine enough to ever keep him drunk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to ever. <Yeah>. Drunk. <laughs> I don't yeah. have enough wine to be forever drunk. <laughs> right and girls decked out in gold, right, and so on and so forth. As if the whole object of existence were the pleasure of Sanchez Gump, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So he's like totally railing on him. Uh, yeah. You know, someone who's like really making this uh, what life is about. This is chapter thirty-three, still part three. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> our perfect law seeks to quell the passions, to disparage and diminish them. Uh, vulgar license and excess, as you know, stem chiefly from an insatiable craving for food drink or sex this impedes one's higher development and harms the more basic right. as well corrupts civic and home life um right so there really is in part three this focus on the individual right the yeah. focus in part one as i said is a lot on the language of the torah but here he's talking about the law which is supposed to refine you and again interestingly in part three even though rambam obviously knows rabbinic sources mm -hmm. he is talking about the law of the Torah, right? Mm -hmm. He's not talking about rabbinic. I wrote an article in which I looked at um, a Rambam on capital punishment, right? Because in the case of capital punishment, the Torah has its own models of capital punishment and the mm -hmm. rabbis have their own models of capital punishment and they're different, right? Mm -hmm. He focuses not on the rabbis, but on the Torah because here mm -hmm. he's trying to say there's law in the Torah and the purpose of the law in the Torah is to refine you as an individual. And mm -hmm. so how do we do it, right? And so he's saying, you're right, here, the, here is what our law is about, quelling the passions, right? Yeah. Diminish them as much as possible, keeping them in the bounds of necessity. Not saying you can't eat, not saying you can't have sex, not saying you can't drink, but to the extent with, that this shifts the focus away from what well, really matters in well, this world. Back yeah. within the bounds of necessity. I mean, that's like the right. that chapter eight that we saw where he says, you know, do what you need, but don't, don't go over. Um, and he says here, the bare pursuit of pleasure practiced by the uncouth crushes the intellectual impulse and ravages right. the body. So the body, we already know, we saw previously, the intellectual yeah. impulse is, a, is huge for him, for sure. Yeah. And then well, he even how you connect, yeah. Yeah. And then he mentions here even in passing about the Spencer or Mora in... Exactly. Uh, yeah. So he mentioned right. the glutton and the drunkard. Yeah. Right. This someone like, what do the rabbis say about this? You know, low of the Libra, right? You know, no, you know, never happened. Right. And <laughs> and what he's saying here is like this is a really important law. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because he's looking at the at the Torah. And giving up wine is, is directly called holy. Right? Well, Nazir, the Nazir. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a holiness to that as well. <laughs> if one forswears this meat or that bread, he may not consume it. This is simple self-discipline yeah. to curb one's cravings. And train oneself in temperance in food and our topic drink yes um so this is um that this is why um we're supposed to be doing it to curb yep. to train oneself so this is all around consumption but even you know even for <laughs> nazir there's also a wine issue that encouraging folks to use as little right. wine as possible. Little wine as possible. Yeah. And then he, yeah. he iterates this idea about one who stains from you, you go dry you're holy Right, right. I mean, isn't is that not the shot? It is. Um, right. I mean, it, yes, it is. It is. I think it's a yes and. I mean, even the sages, the Torah right. itself understands this is not necessarily meant to be forever. <laughs> this no, is meant, absolutely not. Um, absolutely and then, not. Right, right, right. And then once when you do the carbonos and you you bring whatever, you immediately do all the things that you swore off, and you're right. back in everything. We've been going through part three, which is rich yeah. in the the drinking uh, me me mentions the drinking content. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But here in part two is something of significance in chapter thirty six with regards to prophecy. And yes. here, uh, can you share a little bit context around what he's driving at for the for prophecy? Well, so as I said, you know, part of what he is. Uh, he's trying to figure out, you know, how is it that given that the way in which we are 
connected to God, right? That Selem mm-hmm. Udmut, the image and likeness, isn't, mm-hmm. you know, that God has two eyes and nose and a mouth, but instead it's, you know, through the intellect. So if that's right, then, you know, we could imagine that, you know, the kind of highest level of intellect would be that connection with God through prophecy, where, you know, and even in our world, right, as we've seen the development of, uh, of chaos theory, the idea of you could simply, mm-hmm. you know, have a kind of complicated enough computer that could feed in all of the data of, uh, you know, what the weather is everywhere around the world and all the, you know, creatures in the world and where they're located and plants. And so then we can yeah. calculate that the butterfly w- flapping its wings is going to create El Nino or whatever, right? So this <laughs> is, you know, what chaos theory is. And so, you know, by extension, you might say, well, okay, you know, if we simply, you know, focus on the mind and we prepare all the conditions for the mind, it's a, it's actually not enough, says Ramba, mm. Right. That Moshe Rabbeinu, like, you know, is, yeah, perfect in that way. But that's not, that's not everything, right? Mm -hmm. We can reach up, but God also reaches down. And it is that kind of overflowing from, uh, you know, that emanation from an on on high that is going to connect with us. So again, for him, he's a rational mystic. Right. And so, mm-hmm. you know, in other ages of the Jewish people and other, you know, parts of, of our literature, you know, there, you know, the mystical approach is, you know, in some cases, a, um, uh, you know, a non-rational approach, right? Just try and spend some time with the Zohar, right? Uh, but, mm-hmm. you know, what Rambam is saying, well, actually, you know, like we can, we can connect to God through, um, through the mind, through mm-hmm. the intellect, um, yeah. but it's not enough. To say, okay, we're gonna, you know, prepare ourselves, and so, you know, we can take care of our body, we can take care of our soul, we can take care of our mind, but, you know, to become a prophet, a real prophet, <laughs> you know, like like you know Moses, it takes something else, something coming from that kind of emanation. It should come as no surprise, considering everything we've read about what he wrote regarding drinking. Yeah. Uh, uh, that he says uh, he he has set animal cravings at not all favor for the joys of food, drink, or sex, the tactiles. So, uh, and he mentions uh, disgrace. He says they do disgrace us, for we have them yeah. insofar as we are animals like the rest. There being nothing distinctly human about them. Right. Um, so this is uh, takes someone away from the sort of the path to prophecy, as it were. Right. We have a significant piece here in part one. We started with three, one to two, and now we're at one. Okay. This is chapter 33. He yep. says, uh, to make the science of divinity one starting point, those who see right, don't people- start, Don't them. start. Don't start with philosophy. Don't start with metaphysics. I am fascinated. Start, Why is that? Because you start with physics. Interesting. Okay. That's what metaphysics means, right? I, I ask my students, what is meta? They're like, oh, it's so big. You know, it's so <laughs> meta. Yeah. Because what meta means, what meta means is, you know, beyond. In Arabic, it's uh-huh. ma'bad tabia, that which is beyond teva, that which is beyond uh-huh. nature. Because tabia, nature, is physics, mm-hmm. right? The physical world. So first you study, right? That's why he becomes a doctor after his brother David goes down in a shipwreck, mm-hmm. right? He had to go to work as a doctor. He already had that training because that training is primary, and and by the way, right? Like I tell this to my to my students at the Naval Academy all the time. In the College of Engineering and Weapons, because that's what it's called, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to learn a lot of physics, and that's going to tell you about the what, but it's mm-hmm. never going to tell you the why, mm-hmm. right? Where we get the why is from the humanities. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's why you're studying history, which is both part of the social sciences and part of the humanities. Right. It's ultimately what tells us why we should be living, how we should structure our lives. Right. All that mm-hmm. physics can tell us is about how the world is made up. So don't start out with religion. You start out with science. Mm-hmm. And and this is a really amusing picture he's painting for us. He says, one who hazards this divine science unprepared will not just muddle his beliefs, but destroy destroy them. To me, that seems no different right. from feeding me on bread to a nursling or giving this nursling wine to drink. Right, because <laughs> they're gonna vomit it up. Right. Yeah. They can't they can't handle it. 
Yeah. Right? The infant's digestion is too delicate, it says there, to benefit from them. Yeah. Right? Just so true beliefs are veiled, right? Like, you know, uh, an apple of gold with chasings of silver. Hey there, I want to break in yet again. Although I asked for support in financial ways because it does cost some money to make the hosting happen and other aspects of Jewish drinking happen. So your financial support is definitely appreciated. And don't forget, you can go to jewishdrinking.com slash donate. But also another way of supporting the show and everything that Jewish drinking does is also to tell your friends, tell your neighbors. If you like this content, if you like this show, maybe people you know also like it. So feel free to let them know, hey, I have this interesting episode I heard, or a few episodes, or whatever it is, or even a few clips. Feel free to share with your friends. All right. Thank you so much. Now back into the show. We've seen a lot. Obviously, there's more going on in part, or, or sort of the bulk, really, for Maimonides yeah. in, is of dealing with wine and drinking and drunkenness throughout the Guide of the Perplex is in that part three. But we saw a yeah. little bit we just saw this uh, yeah. part one piece, the prophecy, the sort of the path to prophecy of abstaining uh, from drinking in part two. But part three is really significant. He finds it to be, sh he, he understands it's a necessity, but finds it shameful to be focusing on it. Right? Right. right. Also, no, I love that line about people have to defecate, but no one has to be drunk. Right. No one is. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But, you know, I mean, think about, listen, you know, the Jewish drinking program is about drinking, but it's ultimately about Jewish. Mm -hmm. You know, you're teaching Torah through it. And so, you know, it, you know, this is not a whiskey tasting program or bourbon taste, you know, in your case, bourbon tasting program, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, this is you're using it as a vehicle for connecting on a deeper level. And, and mm -hmm. that's, I think, what Rambam is looking for, that... You know, we shouldn't just be focused on, you know, the, um, you know, the physical. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that seems to be key for him to um, the sort of the intellectual, the, the intellectual apprehension. Absolutely. We're really focusing on that and not being mired in the physicality of things. Right. Because uh, physicality is yeah. a source of evil in this world. Yeah. And sort of that seems to be like a core principle and then everything else that, and drinking is not, he doesn't single out drinking exclusively. It's part of the food and sex and other, yeah, he mentions yeah, ill right. temper. It's not just those three, although that seems to be right. a pretty typical trio for him to, to knock at. No, but, but those, you know, listen, giving in to, you know, that ill temper is mm -hmm. in many ways similar to giving into, you mm -hmm. know, the desire for, for wine. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. It, for me, it was, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you and you have a much broader sense of the guide of the perplex considering that you translate it. But for me reading these, talking right. about these wine drinking and drunkenness aspects for him, he really doesn't like it. He finds it to be so shame, first of all, shameful to focus, but also just anybody who, even on an individual level who really just goes beyond what's needed really is not, um, that's not a good thing. He wants to stay with the life of the intellect. I don't know. I, you know, it's fascinating. I don't know that he really discusses the drunkenness aspect so much. Right. I think we saw a couple of pieces. It's just more about part of, I don't know, maybe being drinking culture or um, being sort of swept away with the physicality aspect, not so right. much drinking per se. Right, right. Because it's just one symptom of, of mm -hmm. that being swept away, right? But ultimately, you know, again, like what is what is life about you know he is not taking the hedonistic approach mm -hmm. right he's saying you know there's something there's something more to this world than, than that and mm -hmm. um you know i uh, i think there's something to that that's an important um message i think you mm -hmm. know and, and perhaps holds out potential for the book for folks folks to think about you know what might that message be what new aspects does your translation bring to the English reader table? Yeah. So you can see, uh, you know, when you pulled up Safaria before, right? So there's mm -hmm. the Friedlander translation and there's also uh, a Hebrew translation, right? It's mm -hmm. actually not the, uh, you know, it's not the original Judeo-Arabic there. It is, uh, you know, Hebrew translation, which, mm -hmm. you know, for Safaria's readers by and large, although, you know, there are some texts in Judeo-Arabic on Safaria, um, but the Saudi's translation of the Torah, for instance, uh, mm. is up in Arabic on Safaria. Mm. Um, 
But, um, you know, there are different philosophies of translation. As I said, in the, in the lifetime of the Rambam, the, the guide was translated into Hebrew by Ibn Tibbon, you know, uh, the kind of um, school of Provence that actually came from Spain originally. And mm -hmm. that approach is an approach that was taken up by Shlomo Pinas in 1965 to be as kind of loyal to the words of Rambam's text that you can mm -hmm. be. And so what that means is Ib Ibn Tibbon doesn't have a full Hebrew philosophical vocabulary because the language of philosophy in his day is, um, it's Arabic, right? Mm -hmm. So he creates words a lot of the time <laughs> to, you know, to, to, to provide, um, uh, you know, concepts and uh, you know I'm I'm not a neighbor a native Hebrew speaker, but I can tell you that reading Ibn Timmons is very very hard for me because there are words that I just don't know what the heck those words are. Now mm. there are translations of the guide into modern Hebrew, the you know Rav Yosef Kafach translation mm. and uh, and the um, uh, the um, Michal Schwartz translation from 2004 2005 I believe. The Schwartz translation is amazing. Um, you know, frankly, I don't think there's a, a need to retranslate it into Hebrew since it was translated by Schwartz. The mm. notes are also very, very good, giving you uh, much of the time Rambam's philosophical precedents, whether they are in the Greeks or whether they're in rabbinic literature. Um, mm. But when uh, when Rambam saw Ibn Timon's translation, you know, he took notes on it and sent them to Ibn Timon. Mm. He said, "Listen, you know, you're missing my arguments." You were translating mm. it, you know, the way we would too literally, right? Mm. Um, and the and after the death of the Rambam, it's translated again in Hebrew by um, uh, Judah al Harizi, and it is translated there a little bit more for the argument. Now, the Friedlander translation in the early twentieth century, you might describe a, uh, in some ways as a paraphrase. That is to say, he is not as kind of you know fiercely loyal to the language of Rambam. But, mm. you know, but but wants to kind of paraphrase it because there are words that are difficult. There are phrases that are difficult. Mm. I, I would say that our translation kind of straddles the fence in that we we do we are, you know, loyal to the language, but we do not take the approach of Ibn Tibbon or Shlomo Penis that you know, we translate you know, literally word for word. When Penis translates the book, it, you know, in many ways in the same vein that uh, Franz Rosenzweig and Martin Buber tried to translate the Bible using what they call these light vorter or key mm. words, right? And they always translate a per particular light vort in Hebrew using the same word in German, mm. right? And so Penis says, all right, I'm going to, you know, my, my reader is going to take a word that I translated into English and then look back at the Judeo-Arabic. And so I want to always translate using the same word. The problem with this is that words do not have, you know, in one language and another language, perfectly overlapping kind of, mm. you know, uh, ranges of meaning. So mm -hmm. in my front matter to the, to the guide translation, I say that the, uh, you know, eminent Arabist uh, Franz Rosenthal, um, explained that every word in Arabic means something and it means its opposite <laughs> and it means something having to do with the camel and then something so disgusting you'll have to go look it up. There's a broad semantic range for terms in Arabic. In English, the say, you know, the word that you might translate it into also is a broad semantic range, but it doesn't perfectly overlap. So mm -hmm. penis sometimes engenders contradictions or at least difficulties or infelicities by following this mode of translation. Now, it doesn't bother Penis because he knows that the guide has contradictions and he argues under the influence of Leo Schwartz, uh, uh, um, Strauss rather, who writes, Strauss writes this introduction uh, and Strauss writes, you know, another book called Persecution and the Art of Writing in which he argues that people sometimes can't say what they really mean. So mm -hmm. they encode it so that Hamivin Yavin, the person who knows, <laughs> knows Right, and then the ordinary person might just read it on the surface. So on the surface, Rambam is, you know, kind of palatable to the, you know, to the Pintal Yid who's going to go ahead and read the, you know, the guide and say, all right, I can now understand the Torah in light of science. But the philosopher is going to see deeper and know what Rambam is really saying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just imagine 
that we have concentric circles, the outer meaning for the Pintleid and the inner meaning for the philosopher. So that's how Strauss read the guide, and it is certainly how Penis translates the guide, and it's okay if the guide is difficult to read. It's supposed to be difficult to read because it's only the philosopher who gets the inner of the concentric circles. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Len Goodman and I use a different technology or a different, sure. a different paradigm. Instead of concentric circles, imagine a spiral. So there is something different in the middle, but you are a different person when you start than after you read again and again mm -hmm. and again, you get to the center. So those contradictions are really not supposed to be there. So we translate. Some contradictions are, you know, inevitable, but some are there, you know, are really not supposed to be there. You're supposed to understand that as you get deeper into the argument, you will be a different person and you will read differently. And by the way, this is the same way we read the Torah. All right. When, so when Isaac gives Jacob the blessing, right, and then you know that Esau is going to show up, you know, sometime later, and there's no blessing for him, right? The second time you come around to the Torah, the third time you come around to the fiftieth time, right? It's just you're different. You know more. It's more powerful, right? And that's the approach that we take as translators of the guide. That that penis drawing on the Straussian viewpoint is that you know those concentric circles are incommensurable. Rambam the philosopher is a different person from Rambam the rabbi, but we think that you know it's actually the same person. Not you know perhaps writing for two slightly different audiences, but like his you know like his uh, like his um, audience, his um, his addressee Joseph ibn Judah, you know. Um, you know, it, it, you know, who knows both of these worlds? So too, I think that the guide is written for the the whole person. Hmm. So, so that's our approach. It's you know, it's it, it's not um, you know, kind of um, bifurcatory, <laughs> right? And so, but I think you know, it doesn't mean that you can't sit down with the Judeo Arabic and sit down with our text. It's hard. It's a little harder to do that with Friedlander, hmm. right? With penis, it's easy because, you know, in penis, it's a great resource to those folks who know Judeo Arabic because you can mm. sit down with the translation, then you can sit down with Judeo Arabic, you know, figure mm. out, oh, what is this word? How is it used? Blah, blah, blah. But, mm. you know, most of our readers are not going to be Judeo Arabists. <laughs> and so, in that sense, I hope that the book is valuable to those people as well as to the, you know, the insiders. This has been fantastic, and uh, so this is wonderful. Before we go, is there anything you would like to promote? Yeah, I mean, check out the book. I, I hope that mm. it is really readable. You know, as I said, there are other treatments of the guide that that are that are fabulous, and I think this really is a book um, worth continuing to engage. You know, part two for readers might be difficult because the cosmology. Uh, is different from our cosmology, you know, since the, you know, Copernican revolution, right? We no longer think that, you know, there are seven concentric spheres and so on and so forth with the, you know, the earth at the center of it all. But um, that doesn't mean that a reader cannot get something, I think, of, of greater importance than just that map of the universe, um, but instead a sense of like what the universe is about and how we fit into it. So mm -hmm. I hope it's meaningful. And uh, you know, relative to academic books, it's it's actually pretty cheap. So uh, oh. I'm really glad that Stanford Stanford did a great job of production, and uh, and I'm glad that they uh, they priced it reasonably so that um, you know uh, folks can buy it. Thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to say, L'chaim. <laughs> L'chaim. <laughs>